Hello and welcome to Double Decker Boss. This Woo! is woo. This is a uh, British history podcast where I tell a weird story from British British history to my friend and co-host. Today, my co-host is Steph. Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we. Um, sorry about the delay for a couple of weeks. There hasn't been anything. Uh, happening with the podcast there's been a lot of behind the scenes technical stuff going on but we finally have one ready to go so have you listened to the other two yes i have what did you think of those stories <laughs> <laughs> that is sort of not what you i'd rather learn that in history than i would what they teach us to be fair yeah it is <laughs> much weirder um this one's probably the weirdest one so far in fact, not probably, it definitely is the weirdest one so far. I've wanted to get this one out for a while. <laughs> oh, God, this is going to be great, then. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, I don't even know how to where the microphone is specifically yours to mine. Hopefully, I haven't been covering it up this entire time. Um, right. <laughs> I may have been. I just realised my mistake there. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, we'll be fine. This is a professional podcast. Uh, <laughs> so, the, on the 23rd of August, 1946, uh, Keith... my birthday! What, the 23rd of August? Yeah! Oh my god, wow, oh my god. That is amazing. Uh, 1946 as well, you're much um, older than you seem. Oh, <laughs> Right, so, uh, Keith John Moon was born to Alfred Charles Elf and Kathleen Winifred Kit Moon in northwest London and grew up in Wembley. He was often described as a hyperactive child with a big imagination and loved the BBC radio programme The Goon Show, a surrealist sketch comedy show that aired from 1951 to 1960 and has been cited as a major influence on many people of Moon's generation. Moon attended Alperton Secondary School, um, in which he didn't do very well. His art teacher described him as retardedly artistic, idiotic in other respects. <laughs> He's off to a good start. <laughs> At the age... <laughs> I know, right? What an art teacher. You're retarded. <laughs> Oh, what a time to be alive when he was growing up. Oh, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so at the age of 12, Moon joined the local uh, joined a local band and attempted to learn the bugle, but he found it too difficult. Instead, Moon had a fondness for practical jokes, science and explosions, which will come back later in life. He is a big fan of explosions. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> At age 14, his mother bought him a drum kit. Um, it was soon discovered that he had a natural talent for music and drumming. His music teacher said of him, he has a great ability but must guard against a tendency to show off. His musical teacher is a lot nicer than his art teacher, for a start. <laughs> nicer than the one I had in music in secondary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, he's, he's, he shows off a little bit, but he's good, he's good at it. He's a good boy. Yeah. <laughs> then, in 1961, at the age of 14, Moon dropped out of school to pursue his love of drumming. <laughs> oh my god, my mum would kill me if I did that. <laughs> 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 I'd be slaughtered. <laughs> He was taught to drum professionally by Carlo Little, who was the original drummer of the Rolling Stones, at 10 shillings a lesson. And in 1962, Moon joined the band The Escorts and switched bands soon, af switched bands soon after to join The Beachcomers. The Beachcomers were a small cover band and all the members also had day jobs. Moon worked in a department store and by all who saw it, it didn't look like Heath Moon would ever really amount to anything. The Beachcomers, however, did have something most bands at the time did not. During his time in the group, Moon incorporated theatrical, uh, uh, theatrical tricks into his <laughs> act, including shooting the group's lead singer with a starter pistol. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. This is nothing compared to where we're going to end up going. This is this is oh God. this is Why sane. Do people do that now? That sounds 
sounds great. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. I'd love to go to a concert where a guy got shot who's singing the lead singer. <laughs> Uh, in 1964, at the age of 17, uh, Moon auditioned for another band. This band consisted of Roger Daltrey, Pete Townsend and John Entwistle. Together, this group would go on to form the prolific rock band The Who. So, Keith Moon is a part of The Who. He's the drama from The Who. Um, the founding members of The Who, Roger Daltrey, Pete Townsend and John Entwistle, grew up in Acton, London and went to Acton County Grammar School. Townsend's father, Cliff, played the saxophone and his mother, Betty, had sung in the entertainment division of the Royal Air Force during World War II and had both supported their son's interest in rock and roll. Townsend and Entwistle became friends in their second year of Acton County and formed a trad jazz group. Entwistle also played the French horn in the Middlesex School Symphony Orchestra. Both were interested in rock and Townsend particularly admired Cliff Richard's uh, debut single, Move It!, Entwistle moved to Dakota. I can't talk now. Uh, <laughs> Entwistle moved to guitar, but struggled with it due to his large fingers. Um, <laughs> and moved to bass. <laughs> and moved to um, uh, bass or bass, probably bass, on hearing the guitar work of June Eddy. Uh, Daltrey, who was a year above, had moved to Acton from Shepherd's Bush. Um, a more working class area. He had trouble fitting in at school and had discovered gangs and rock and roll. He was expelled at 15 and found work on a building site. In 1959, he started The Detours, a band who would, that would evolve into The Who. The band played professional gigs such as um, corporate and wedding functions and Daltrey kept a close eye on the finances as well as the music. Uh, Daltrey spotted Entwistle by chance on the street carrying a bass and recruited him into the Detours. In mid-1961, Entwistle suggested Townsend as a guitarist. Daltrey on the lead guitar, Entwistle on bat... bat I can't talk at all now. Hang on, let me reread what I just said. I'm going too fast. Um, Daltrey on lead guitar, Entwistle on bass... Uh, Harry Wilson on drums and Colin Dawson on vocals. The band played instrumentals um, by The Shadows and The Ventures and a variety of pop and jazz covers. Daltrey was considered the leader and, according to Townsend, ran things the way he wanted them. Uh, Wilson was fired in mid-1962 and replaced with Doug Sandon, though he was a lot older than the rest of the band, married and a more proficient musician, having been uh, playing semi-professionally semi for two years. With the new band secure, uh, when the new band secured but failed an audition with the Fontana um, Record Company in early 1964, uh, the label's producer, Chris Parameter, um, expressed a dislike for Sandon's drumming. Townsend suggested to the other members um, that Sandon leave the band. Sandon gave a month's notice and left in April. Uh, so that's how they started out. Uh, so the new band, uh, the new band needed a drummer. Moon approached the band at one of their gigs with his hair dyed ginger and dressed in full red clothes. <laughs> God. Townsend said he was a ginger right vision. He's <laughs> a ginger vision, man. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Moon. <laughs> <laughs> Moon told the group he could play the, the drums better than any seasoned drummer and the group offered him a chance to prove this by standing in for the fill-in drummer they had for one of their songs in the second half called Roadrunner. Moon completely destroyed the drum kit on stage. <laughs> Moon said of the incident, they said, go ahead. And I got behind this other guy's drums and did one song, Roadrunner. I'd had several drinks to get my courage up. And when I got on stage, I went, ah, on the drums, broke the bass drum, pedal and two skins, got off. I figured that was it. I was scared to death. Afterwards, I was sitting at the bar and Pete came over. He said, you come here. Uh, I said, mild as you please, yes, yes. And Roger, who was the spokesman then, said, what are you doing next Monday? I said, nothing. I was working during the day, selling plaster. He said, you'll have to give up work. There's a gig on Monday. If you want to come to it, we'll pick you up in the van. I said, right, and that was it. <laughs> oh, my God. So he 
destroyed a whole lot of drum kit and they were like, you know what, we need this guy. Yeah? He was like, <laughs> he just went, ah! <laughs> destroyed everything. <laughs> and they were like, yep. This guy's crazy, we want him. Yeah. Moon was never actually formally invited to join the Who, but would go on to be a key member of the band. <laughs> Moon's arrival in the group completely changed its dynamic. When Sandham had been in the band, he was the sane one. <laughs> Daughtry and Townsend would constantly fight each other, but Sandham had always calmed them down. Moon, on the other hand, would always get in fights with Entwistle, claiming, We have really absolutely nothing in common apart from music. <laughs> Moon also got in fights with the other band members, um, and this meant they now just all hated each other. Uh, <laughs> it's a good way to do a band, all hating each I other. I guess so. Yeah, I mean, it worked out. I mean, they're the Who. They're the fucking Who. They're amazing, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Who's first hit in the UK was I Can't Explain in 1965. Two years later, The Who invaded the US and made the American charts with the top um, 10 hit I Can See For Miles and the band's success took off. Townsend described Moon as completely different from any person I've ever met. Moon was no... <laughs> Moon... <I wonder> why. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, he destroyed my drum. He's going to be my best friend now who I hate. Must be expensive as well. Yeah, Jeez. it gets to that in a bit, actually. There's oh, the whole no. thing about costs. And oh my. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, uh, so he described him as completely different from any person he'd ever met. Moon was notorious for his lack of timekeeping in his drumming, which created a sound like no other drummer produced. And rather than having Moon fix this problem, the band decided to change their music around him. So he can't even play the drums properly. Um, <laughs> his music teacher was just like, yeah, you can do it. And then he was like, yes. I'm... Yeah, and then he's like, yes, I'm going to leave school. I'm going to join a band and I'm going to be famous now. And the music teacher was like, maybe. Yeah, that was what the music teacher was saying about, you know, toning down his tendency to show off. He's like, maybe, maybe, you know, do some woodworking, you know. <laughs> Oh, no, that he was just going to go all over these drums, you know? Yeah. Just, oh, dear. Oh, yeah. dear. Um, <laughs> well, they didn't want that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, the band uh, found Moon Bass's timekeeping on his mood. He also wouldn't use the drum kit like a normal person. Instead, according to Entwistle, he'd play zigzag. That's why he had two sets of tom-toms. He'd move his arms forward like a skier. <laughs> Why'd you play the drum zigzag? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh... <laughs> oh dear. On top of all that, uh, Moon also wouldn't play the drums how he was supposed to um, for a, a song and he would add drum beats whenever he felt like it. So he wouldn't even oh. listen to the music sheets. He just did. It, it, it was just sort of like, you know what, just yeet. That was it, just yeet. Yeah. <laughs> Moon's kit was also the biggest in rock. At one stage, boasting at least 10 tom-toms, twin bass drums, twin tampani, snare, and half a dozen cymbals, and a gong. Oh my god. <laughs> it was around this time that Moon began taking amphetamines. He spent his share of the band's income quickly on drugs and alcohol, and was a regular at London clubs such as the Speakeasy and the Bag O' Nails. I love that club name. I want to know the story about the guy who started that club. I just imagine some Irish, um, some stereotypical Irish guy like, It's a bag of nails! <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound too like, far off. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, so where was I? Yeah. Moon loved touring, and he, when he wasn't on tour with the band performing live, he would become agitated and restless. While performing, 
M Keith Moon took centre stage. Moon announced his arrival in spectacular fashion on The Who's first real single, I Can't Explain, in 1965, on which his rifle shot snare preempted Ro Roger Daltrey's leap in the chorus. Um, during a show at the railway... Ra I can't talk at all now. Oh my god. <laughs> during a show at the Railway Tavern in Harrow, Townsend smashed his guitar after accidentally breaking it. When the audience demanded he do it again, Moon kicked over his drum kit. The band described this as auto-destructive art. It's auto-destructive art, man. It's ginger vision and we've got auto-destructive art. <laughs> That's what ginger vision does to people. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> ginger thing. Uh, 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 in which the bad members, particularly Moon's and Moon and Townsend, elaborately destroyed their equipment. Moon developed a habit of kicking over his drums. Townsend later said, A set of skins is about $300, then £96, and after every show he'd just go bang, bang, bang and kick the whole thing over. So, he's spending $300 um, a show on drums. Yeah. Uh, the How band members. What? Sorry. How did they even manage? I don't know. Uh, the band members were known for destroying their instruments on stage, and at the end of performances, this ideally suited Moon's personality. Moon was said to go through the stands and foot pedals like a knife through butter. Oh. <laughs> Pete Townsend would smash his guitar into pieces against the floor while Keith relished in knocking over his drum set, kicking his cymbals and tossing his tom-toms across the stage. But Moon would always take things one step further. At one performance, he blew up his drum set with explosives uh, to shock his fellow band members and TV hosts who were all caught off guard by the explosion originating from inside his drum. <laughs> But Moon wouldn't just smash up his belongings on stage. In 1966, while on tour in Berlin, Moon smashed up his hotel room in a drug fueled fury. After this, Moon would smash up as much as he could whenever he could when they were on tour. I think he's got a problem. Yeah, yeah. Just a little bit, I'm not sure, but you know, it's just the theory. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of one tour, while on their way to the airport, Moon told his driver to turn around because he'd forgotten something in his hotel room. Once back at the hotel room, he grabbed his TV and threw it out of the window into the hotel pool. <laughs> oh my god. Then he calmly went back to his car and said, Phew, almost forgot. <laughs> Moon was now addicted to destroying things uh, as much as he was to drugs and alcohol. During one tour, Townsend walked into the um, bathroom in Moon's hotel room and noticed the toilet had disappeared with only the S Ben remaining. Uh, the drummer explained that since the cherry bomb was about to explode, he'd thrown it down the toilet and then he showed Townsend the case of cherry bombs. Moon then started smashing things even when the Who weren't on tour. Moon destroyed his friends' homes and even his own, throwing furniture from upper story windows and lighting fires. It was estimated that his uh, destruction of hotel toilets and plumbing costs cost as much as £300,000. In hotel oh. toilets. And that's it. That's, that's only the hotel toilets. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. I think I finally worked out where the microphone thing is as well, as an aside. So you might be louder on the audio now than you were, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Sticks of dy dynamite became his explosive of choice tra um, uh, for trashing toilets in the biggest way possible. <laughs> He's throwing dynamite oh, down toilets. Um, he, quote, All that porcelain flying through the air was quite unforgettable, Moon remembers. I never realised dynamite was so powerful. I'd been used to penny bangers uh, before. <laughs> what? I mean... Oh my god, dynamite explodes! Oh my god! What and a these surprise! Toilets! They're going everywhere! It's amazing! Oh, that, if that's not drugs talking, I don't know what is. <laughs> like, I'm 
sorry, but how... Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Just... Yeah? Who gets pleasure out of exploding toilets in a hotel room? At least do it somewhere else. Yeah. It's very specifically much... weird. Yeah. <laughs> Wait... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, I think he's just got a hatred of toilets, maybe. I like to use nature. I go out into the garden. <laughs> 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 Fuck toilets. Oh, gee. I... Oh, God. I'm still trying to get my head around the fact that it's toilets. Not even, like, not a pillow. Not, you know. Why a toilet? <laughs> Why? <laughs> oh my god. Um, what a strange little child. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's not even a child anymore, just... Oh, a man. He was a strange little <laughs> child when his music teacher was like, Yeah, yeah, I believe in you. Maybe it's just the music teacher's fault. Yeah, the music teacher took him into the school toilets one day and was like, Right, here's a stick of dynamite, here's a toilet, I'm going to teach you how to be a man. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget about the drums as well. <laughs> Destroy the school drums. Oh my god. Oh my god. Um he quickly develops a reputation for destroying bathrooms and blowing up toilets. No shit. <laughs> Uh, I bet they didn't want it, literally. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Because, you know, I'll blow it up. <laughs> oh, God. I think um, they don't want... <laughs> I'm surprised they haven't... They didn't go, all oh, right, we'll have the rest of you, just not him. Yeah. <laughs> just, he can sleep outside. <laughs> yeah. He gets to sleep in a tent while everyone else is in the hotel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you just see, like, a tent exploding. Stuff going <laughs> everywhere. It's like, I will explode something. I don't care if it's a tent or a toilet. <laughs> Something's got to explode, and it doesn't care what. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing oh, you know, God. he arrives in A&E. He's, he's, he can't find a tent or a toilet. He's, oh my God. he's blown oh. himself up. No. Oh, that would be, yeah. That would be the best that thing. That would be the best thing. Um, It does go down a weird path, though. We're, we're only at the beginning here. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> Uh, so, the destruction mesmerised him and enhanced his public image as a rock pre premier and hellraiser. Tony Fletcher wrote that no toilet or hotel changing room was safe. And Pete Townsend remarked, we got thrown out of ho every hotel we ever stayed in. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> and they're just like, this is fine. Uh, <laughs> this, this is just the normal now. <laughs> uh, as soon as Moon sobered up, he'd pay for all the damages he caused, meaning he was never arrested for any of this and got away with it. <laughs> Not lucky. <laughs> it was around this time that Moon met Kim Kerrigan at a Who concert in 1965. Later that year, she discovered she was pregnant with Moon's child, so they got married in 1966 at Brent Registry Office. The marriage was a rocky one, like many musicians' relationships at the time. On several occasions, Moon publicly denied he was married or a father. He insisted Kim end her modelling career while taking up modelling as a side job for himself. <laughs> <laughs> no, only I get to be a model. <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, and due this to Moon's... This child. <laughs> this child's going to have so many problems. Yeah. And due to Moon's uh, drug and alcohol abuse, he was often violent towards Kim. On one occasion, Kim hid in the bathroom while Moon attempted to cut down the door with a knife. Oh. oh. Yeah. Poor Kim. <laughs> yeah. Mandy Moon, which is an amazing name, if your last name's Moon. I love that. Uh, mm. <laughs> Keith Moon's daughter <laughs> later remarked when he was home there was a lot of drinking and it wasn't really conductive having a kid in that environment my memories are not all bad but I was not close to him Moon did have a softer side though as Mandy said I don't remember him saying too much to me but he used to call me his little lion cub because he loved lions and had a lion necklace that he wore um, <laughs> so he's completely insane but he likes lions yeah, I mean, that's kind of the same thing. We know one thing he isn't going to blow up now. <laughs> uh, it's her or a lion. Yeah. <laughs> I hope no one gets him a lion, though. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Um, on the 23rd of August, uh, 1967, on a tour opening for Herman's Hermits. Don't know what that is either, but oh my God, I want to. <laughs> Moon celebrated what he said was his 21st birthday, although at the time uh, it was to be his 20th at a Holiday Inn in Flint, Michigan. Uh, End oh, Whistle later said... Inn. What, sorry? We gotta love Holiday Inn. Yeah. <laughs> at a Holiday Inn in Flint, Michigan. End Whistle later said he decided that if it was uh, to be a uh, publicised fact that it was his 21st birthday, he would be able to drink. The drummer immediately began drinking upon his arrival in Flint. I mean, Flint's that place where you can't drink the water, so what else is he going to do? <laughs> oh, God. Um, this can only go downhill. It does only go downhill. Downhill is the only place to go from here. <laughs> oh, dear. At the hotel, Moon started a food fight, and cake soon began flying through the air. Uh, the drummer yeah, I mean... knocked over a, a note, knocked out part of his front tooth. At the hospital, doctors could not give him anaesthetic due to his inebriation and uh, before uh, before removing the remainder of his tooth. Back at the hotel, a melee erupted, fire extinguishers were set off, guests and objects thrown into the swimming pool and a piano reportedly destroyed. The chaos only ended when police arrived with guns drawn. <laughs> I just imagine somebody picking somebody else up and throwing them at the piano. Oh, hell yeah, that would be great. <laughs> and it's all because oh of God. Moon. <laughs> Blame it on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> look, look in the sky, can you see it? It got drunk and told me to start throwing people at the piano. No, Jerry, it's not that moon. It's not that moon, it's oh, a different that moon. reminds me of those people that... um. That blame everything on their star sign or something. <laughs> My star sign's Keith Moon. My star sign's a guy who likes blowing up toyletts. It my... wasn't my fault, it was the moon. Told me to. My horoscope told me that uh, I was going to go to a hotel and there wouldn't be a toilet, so... <laughs> I threw someone at a piano. <laughs> <laughs> I really needed the toilet. I had to take it out on somebody. <laughs> and it was his fault. <laughs> oh, okay, so. On the 4th of January, 1970, Moon accidentally killed his friend, driver, and bodyguard, Neil Boland. <laughs> How do you accidentally kill someone? Excuse me? Your just complete pause and no reaction says it all there. Just the <laughs> shock. <laughs> oh my god. Um, uh, it was outside the Red Lion pub in Hatfield, Her uh, Hertfordshire, sorry. Um, pub patrons began uh, to attack uh, his Bentley. Uh, Moon drunk began driving to escape them. In the confusion, he ran over Boland. After an investigation, <laughs> the coroner ruled Boland's death an accident. Um... But Moon was haunted oh. for it, uh, by it for years, and would constantly oh. wake up after having nightmares about running over his friend again. That's kind of sad. Yeah, but I think that's the only thing I feel bad for him at the moment. For yeah, I mean, it's his own fault. He's blowing up toilets. It's kind of his own fault. He killed his friend because he didn't have yeah. to get drunk and start driving over people, but he did. <laughs> he just felt like it. Yeah. Oh my god. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> in 1973 <laughs> I didn't know anything about The Who before researching this and this is completely insane it, it sounds mental yeah I mean it's like that's what happened with bands back then I mean look at John Lennon I mean mm. he's, one, he's one of these in himself I mean the issue is so it's so common knowledge the stuff he did but yeah He's just as insane as Keith... M well, I mean, John Lennon didn't blow up toilets, but... Yeah. <laughs> I, it's just sort of... It seems to be a common thing people in groups do. Yeah. Anyway, which is really sad, but it's sort of... It happens, I guess. Yeah. 
1973, The Who were on tour again, but now Moon's insane lifestyle was catching up to him. At the band's debut concert, Keith Moon passed out midway through a song. He was then carried off by a group of roadies, given a shower and an injection of corsetone, and went back on stage 30 minutes later. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> They're in the middle of a song and then he just passes out and some roadies drag him off stage, slap him across the face and give him a shower and go, right, you're good to go. Yeah, right, come on then. Off we go. <laughs> oh, my God. Moon Here we go again. Out... <laughs> <laughs> Moon passed out again during another song and was again removed from the stage. The band continued without him for several songs before Townsend asked, Can anyone play the drums? I mean, somebody good. Uh, <laughs> a drummer in the audience, Scott Haplin, came up and played the rest of the show. I mean, that guy, he's having a good day. Yeah, he's, that would make anyone's day. Yeah, he loves The Who, he's got to see a big concert, and then he gets to play the drums for them. Exactly. Yeah. That's wholesome. Yeah. Uh, also in 1973, Moon's wife Kim left him, taking Mandy with her, after concluding his increasingly out-of-control behaviour could not be moderated. You're Moon... a psycho. <laughs> <laughs> you You're blew up our toilet for the fourth time <laughs> this <kids>. month! <laughs> the kid's gonna be just sat on the toilet, the next thing you know, <laughs> the kid's gone. <laughs> we had to go to A&E again because she was on the toilet! <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention we don't have a bathroom door because he stabbed it down with a knife. <laughs> oh, what a household. <laughs> I know, it must be kind of scary. Yeah. In 1976, The Who played yet another tour, and during this tour, Moon passed out on stage again, and the show was rescheduled. Whoa. The next evening, Moon smashed up his hotel room like he always did, but this time he badly cut himself in the process and then passed out. He was discovered by manager Bill Kerbishley, who took him to the hospital, telling him, I'm going to get the doctor and get you nice and fit so you're back within two days, because I want to break your fucking jaw. You fucked this band around so many times and I'm not fucking having it anymore. <laughs> Doctors told Kerbishley that if he had not intervened, Moon would have bled to death. Well, I mean, would they really complain that much? <laughs> yeah. I'm not trying to be too mean, but... I yeah. Think they would have the toilets are safe! <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I'm surprised they didn't start on the showers, to be fair. Mm. Water just going everywhere from the pipe. This just left. Oh, I bet he had a whale of a time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Moon Those was then in hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Moon was then in hospital for eight days, and the band were concerned he'd be unable to complete the tour, but he did. They weren't concerned about him, they were just concerned he wouldn't complete the tour. <laughs> <laughs> they were just like, no, nah, we don't really give to <laughs> <laughs> During the band's recording sabbatical between 1976 and 1978, Moon gained a considerable amount of weight. By the time The Who's invitation-only show at the Garment State Cinema on the 15th of December 1977 for The Kids Are Alright occurred, Moon was visibly overweight and had difficulty sustaining a solid performance. Oh, uh, dear. <laughs> like, he's that overweight. He's not just a bit overweight. He's so overweight. He's that Oh, I just knocked the microphone. Sorry for anyone hearing just a big loud bang then. Um, he's so overweight that he's like, I'm having a heart attack every three seconds. <laughs> oh. uh, not to mention that he keeps passing out and they have to take him off stage, uh, slap him, bring him back on stage again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much to keep him alive. Yeah. For the cover of their 1978 oh. album, Who Are You, which is a great name for a Who album, uh, <laughs> Moon is sitting in a chair, visibly trying to hide his weight. According to Rhodey, Dave C.Y. Langston, after seeing Moon in the studio trying to overdub drums for the album, he said, After two or three hours, he got more and more sluggish. He could barely hold a drumstick. I mean, wouldn't anyone after two or three hours? But... <laughs> oh dear. But 
Um, this was because Moon was going sober. In 1975, he had met Swe- a Swedish model named Annette Walter Lax. They'd fallen in love, and Annette was desperate to have Moon go sober and convinced him to try. At first, when doctors recorded Moon's chemical intake at breakfast, a bottle of champagne, corvisor and amphetamines, they concluded that there was no hope for his rehabilitation. That's his breakfast. That's about right. (laughs) His breakfast, he didn't even mention, you know, cereal or toast. His breakfast is a bottle of champagne and some drugs. Like, even a sandwich would have been a bit more (laughs) sane. Like, honestly, or leftover pizza, it's... (laughs) No, he's getting drunk, blowing up toilets, all before 11am. Oh my god, I wish I could even be awake before 11. (laughs) Same here. (laughs) Uh, So, but then Moon was not discouraged, and he began a a prescribed course of hem... I can't pronounce that. Hem in verin, uh, or clom... Fucking hell. (laughs) Clommeth... Clomethazolone, a sedative, uh, to uh, alleviate his alcohol withdrawal symptoms. These pills are not recommended to be taken outside of hospitals um, with proper supervision because of their addictive quality. The doctor that prescribed the pills to Moon was unaware of his lifestyle. (laughs) So... But how can you be unaware of it, is what I don't get about that. He goes to the doctor, he's like, look, doc... Oh my god, I I have a bottle of champagne for breakfast. I'm addicted to blowing up toilets. I want so many drugs, I just keep passing out all the time. I'm really fat from stress eating. I, I've got such an addictive personality. I need these pills that'll stop me being addicted to alcohol. And then he's like, yeah, take these pills. Oh, by the way, they're addictive. <laughs> he's just left. That's just the dumbest thing. But I mean, at least he won't stop taking them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, on the 6th of September 1978 uh, Moon and Annette were guests of Paul and Linda McCartney at the preview of a film The Buddy Holly Story after dining with the McCartneys at the Peppermint Park in Covent Garden Moon and Annette returned to their flat he watched a film The Abom- Abominable Doctor Flibes my cat's just arrived sorry oh, hello Oh, he's lovely, but he's literally right where the microphone is. (laughs) Right, I'm going to move out of his way. Right, there we go. Um, (laughs) He's going to want to go outside now, uh, but we're nearly done, so he can wait. Uh, (laughs) um, uh, He, Moon then asked Annette to cook him steak and eggs. When she objected, Moon replied, If you don't like it, you can fuck off. These were his last words. <laughs> what, before he died or she left? <laughs> before he died. Oh. His last words, the man blowing up toilets who, drank, who drinks champagne for breakfast, his last words were, if you don't like it, you can fuck off. I mean, it's quite fitting for a man of his character yeah that's the <laughs> nicest way of putting it uh <laughs> i mean at least it's a creative way of going out i guess yeah not exactly child friendly but <laughs> yeah this episode really isn't um <laughs> <laughs> Keith Moon It's just great though Yeah, it's the best uh, <laughs> Keith Moon died on the 7th of September 1978 From an accidental overdose of the prescription drug uh, Clomid oh, That name again um, Which um, is indicated to treat symptoms of acute alcohol withdrawal He was instructed to take one pill when he felt a craving for alcohol But no more than three pills a day Authorities well, we determined know that's not gonna work. Yeah. Authorities determined that there were thirty two pills in Moon's system at the time of his death. Six pills had been ingest um digested and the other thirty two were just still in his system from before. So that's uh, like way over ten times what he was told to take. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um 
the a significant enough amount to kill him. He grossly abused the very drug that was supposed to help him wean off his destructive booze habit. Oh, how sad. Yeah. Um. There was also a bit I left out because I thought it was too weird. But while we're digging ourselves in a hole here, I'll mention it at the end. Um, even though it's not written down, which is that I uh, did some research into The Who and found out that Pete Townsend in the early 2000s was arrested um, for basically being a paedophile, um, oh. but then uh, the charges were dropped um, because oh. they couldn't find sufficient enough evidence. But yeah, there's a little well, note to end on. Very, very strange. Yeah, I mean, he I is very a ginger vision describing guy who's just like, you destroyed my drum kit, now you can be in my band. <laughs> <laughs> the ginger vision destroyed the drum kit and himself. Yeah. And the guy who <laughs> described him as such likes kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So, there you go. That's the story of The Who and Keith Moon. Oh. I mean, at least they can't say it's been boring. Yeah. Yeah, what a life. That's something. <laughs> oh, I'm currently trying to work on another script for a podcast that I've... I'm actually glad that technical issues led to this being uh, late because I need more time to work on that one because I'm trying to do one that's set in medieval times about a oh. weird story from medieval times and it is quite funny but it's harder to write the further back you go because of yeah. the less research. So it's taking me a while, but I'm looking forward to that one. Um, <laughs> this is just going to be great. It's like, it's, oh, it's better than just sitting and reading a, reading a set textbook about something that happened because you don't get all the, like the funny bits out of it. Yeah, exactly. And I think that you are a hilarious co-host as well. I've had so much fun doing this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, God. I just find it amusing. Like, I just like hearing things I've not heard before. Yeah. It is just hilarious. Just... Uh, so yeah. uh, thank you. And thank, ev and thank you, everyone else, for listening. Yes, thank you. Woo. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Moon, ah. toilet exploder. <laughs> Here's my business card. It's a bit of shrapnel from the toilet. <laughs> yeah, they just framed it now. Well, look, this was like the toilet from before. It, it got exploded and now it's just on the wall. He just takes a camera with him and he takes pictures of the toilets before and ah. after. <laughs> Here you go. I think you understand what I mean. Oh my god, if he had a, like, album of just the toilets. The toilets, <laughs> an album name. The toilet oh album. God. I would love that. I wonder what his kid thinks of him, though. Yeah, I mean, there's been interviews <laughs> and stuff. So. Oh my god. It's something to look up. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely going to see if I can find something. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. <laughs>